You better be listening to Sleezoids or I must break you. My name is Martin. I'm 84 years old. People think I'm crazy when I tell them how old I am. I'd like to be normal. It's not easy living the way I do. I have to be careful all the time. I'm pretty good at it. I think as I get older, I get better. I haven't been caught yet. We are proud to announce a truly outstanding rock opera film. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Sleezoids, the podcast where we go down the rabbit hole of 20th century genre fare from the most influential canon classics to the trashiest exploitation films we can get our hands on and invite you to tag along in helping us create a canon of sleaze. Each week is a double feature grindhouse style where we discuss two films loosely related by subject, genre, actor, filmmaker, or franchise, and along with our honorary Sleezoids, which you can become by subscribing on Patreon. We're taking revenge with our boy Clint Eastwood next week, so join the sleaze. (laughs) <laughs> we decide on all the official ratings and rankings for every film that we cover. Patreon subscribers also get an honor shout out and two bonus episodes every single month, which we have been doing for uh, over three years. There's something like 90 plus bonus episodes as well as our yeah. bonus transmission series where we talk about new release genre films, um, which are still coming out, hopefully, for the <laughs> foreseeable future. Um, so if you haven't made the jump yet, patreon.com slash these ways podcast recommend doing that. Uh, speaking of which, we do have a bunch of people who made the jump this week, uh, including uh robbie shane gray uh riley pelling who actually upped uh his pledge from the five to the ten dollars a month who's joining us now for the month uh, virtual screenings we do monthly nice um which we do live for people and for anyone who has been asking for it we had a couple people asking for it we now also record all of those live recordings for anyone who can't make them at the scheduled time and we post them up uh for the ten dollar patrons too so if, if you happen to miss one you can still always go back and watch them so thanks to riley for for doing that and for showing up um we also had wesley o'connor sign up uh john brennan and i think that's everyone for this week so thanks so much to you guys hope you guys are uh, enjoying all those bonus episodes yeah Uh, that's the one plug for the week the other plug as always is apple Podcasts. if you guys are listening on apple Podcasts, and i see the stats i know that you are i see you right now (laughs) scroll down to the very bottom uh, give us a good old rating and review down there it helps us climb the ranks and find new listeners And then the very last plug is merch. Uh, If you guys like the uh, poster art that local uh, based out of Toronto horror artist Trevor Henderson did for the podcast, you can get that put on anything you want. Uh, You can get it put on a shirt, a hoodie, uh, a notebook, a pillow. You can just get a poster if you're uh, interested, like Jamie and I have in our own places. Looks great. Um, yeah, there, if, if that interests you at all, there is a link in the description for that or also at sleezoidspodcast.com. All right. I think I think that's our intro, right? You're I did it. Yeah. Welcome back. Welcome back to another week. Uh, as always, I'm your host, Josh Lewis. Joining me also, as always, is my co-host, Jamie Miller. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back. I think um, two weeks ago would have been the last time uh, you folks would have heard from us, and we would have had special guest, returning guest from the Struggle Session podcast, Leslie Lee, on to uh, talk about in in uh, uh, to, to time with the release of the sort of legacy sequel quasi remake. I haven't seen it yet, unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> so I can't say. Uh, to talk about the original Candyman from 1992 directed by Bernard Rosen with with um, Tony Todd and Virginia Madsen which was a lot of fun breaking down um, with Leslie and how just absolutely gorgeous and sort of thoughtful and in terms of uh, uh, craft how beautiful that film is absolutely and then we paired it with uh, Tales from the Hood from 1995 we kind of talked about uh, 90s uh, horror that took on sort of uh, social commentary and, uh, you know, very specific to the um, black community in America. And uh, Tales from the Hood especially is crazy good. And uh, <laughs> we made a, a, yeah. I, I think we made the case for it that it should be considered one of the best horror films of the 90s. Oh, yeah. And a- absolutely is one of the best uh, anthology, like horror short um, films uh, yeah. that I've, yeah. that I've ever seen. Yeah, without a doubt, one of my favorite anthologies of all time. So, highly recommend. Yeah, so if you didn't listen to that episode, again, uh, any podcast listener of choice, that was uh, 
the free episode two weeks ago. And then last week we did uh, the patrons. They voted on, uh, you know, they, they vote on an episode uh, once every two months. And we, we hit that episode once again. And you guys voted for a uh, t- Tony Scott double feature from the 90s of Last Boy Scout from 1991 and the <laughs> fan from 1996, which is Tony Scott taking on two of the most absurd sort of quasi action thriller comedy screenplays, uh, that, you know, existed in the world at the time and just <laughs> directed the absolute shit out of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The two, two of the most wild films and, uh, specifically with last boy scout. And I mean this in a good way. One of the dumbest movies I've ever watched. And, uh, once again, I mean that as a compliment. <laughs> Yes, Tony Tony Scott, um, unbelievable filmmaker, and in the '90s he was really on one, uh, you know, adapting Shane Black, and then also working with De Niro and basically yeah. making a version of the King of Comedy, where D- the De Niro character is just very into baseball, <laughs> and um, he likes stabbing baseball players uh, to the sounds of Nine Inch Nails. So if that sounds appealing to you at all, uh, the fan 1996 that was last week's bonus episode. Go uh, listen to that. Yes. But this week, moving on, we have uh, a very special guest joining us. Many of uh, our listeners, I'm sure, are going to be familiar with him because he is an actor in uh, such films that you might have heard of, like Wes Anderson's Moonrise Kingdom, Jim Jarmusch's uh, Patterson, which was Woo. one of my all-time favorite films. Uh, I, I think I put it on my top 10 of the uh, 2010s. Yeah. And also... Uh, he is uh, in a film that you can watch that's out right now called It Takes Three, and that is Jared Gilman. Jared, how you doing? I'm good. Hey, thank you for the intro. Uh, <laughs> happy to be here. Um, yeah, I'm excited uh, to talk about uh, the two movies that, that we watch. Yeah, I well, th- that's the, that, that's maybe where we should start because normally, obviously, we okay. have a guest pick the double feature, but um, you know, the, yeah, we, I like said we, you we, a we were discussing list. a double feature <laughs> that you wanted to do, and and uh, we were kind of like uh, these movies were things Jared wanted to watch. That was the double feature this week. <laughs> yeah, it was just like yeah, I just because like I have a huge ass watch list on my IMDb, on my private IMDb, and it's just like. Uh, every time I do one of these, I always feel like I, I want to just like, it's like the perfect excuse to just like inch away at it. And then, you know, <laughs> yeah. cause then at least I'm like watching something and then talking about it with people. So yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, no, well, well, what, 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 what films are we talking about this week? So, uh, uh, it was funny, this whole process, I sent you like a whole list and then you pick, and I guess, well, you know, you, you, you did choose the, the films, but, but, but they work on my watch list. Um, that counts. Yeah, he, he sent me a list of like 20 films, and I was like, okay, how do I work out a pairing that these two worked? And so the, the connection between these two is hilarious because I started out with just, well, they're both one word titles, and they're both the names of, of boys say, in the 70s. I thought of another connection, though. I thought of another connection, though. They're both yeah. films about these, these like troubled young men whose parents convince them of something that they either are or aren't yeah that's true like, these, Tommy, are, these are both definitely sort like quasi coming of age 70s films done yeah. in like a very specific kind of genre context and definitely both deal with abusive yeah. parents mm-hmm. or oh, abusive yeah. families in in, mm-hmm. in a way um mm-hmm. but yeah th- those two films are tommy tommy and <laughs> Uh, Ken Russell. I am very excited that we can talk about Ken Russell again because we've. This is our. I think our fourth or fifth time talking about Ken Russell, and um, he's you know, a wild I'd, man. I'd, he's a he, underrated. He's fucking director. crazy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I'm glad underrated. we're we're talking about him. But then we're also going to be talking about Martin 1977 mm-hmm. from George Romero. But yeah, also it's worth noting that despite the fact that those films kind of have a quasi connection, they could not be more stylistically different yeah. films. Very different. <laughs> Extremely different. <laughs> But but yeah, both enjoyable. I mean, you know, both very good. I I thought they were both like great movies. I, I was uh, very cinematically satisfied by, by by the end of both films. Yeah. Um. Hell yeah. Well, I'm excited to uh, jump into it. So let's let's yeah. start off here. We're gonna do chronologically. I think we're gonna start off with Tommy. Director Ken Russell and producer Robert Stigler have made a film of Tommy. 
and assembled some of the greatest names in music and the cinema. Tommy by The Who and based on the rock opera by Peter Townsend stars Anne Margaret, Oliver Reed, Jack Nicholson, Elton John, Eric Clapton, Tina Turner, Roger Daltrey as Tommy. Don't miss Tommy, the film. Your senses will never be the same again. All right, we are talking about Tommy, the 1975 uh, British uh, satirical fantasy drama rock <laughs> opera film. That's right. Written and directed uh, by Ken Russell and uh, based upon the Who's 1969 concept rock opera album, Tommy, about a uh, psychosomatically deaf, mute, and blind boy who becomes a pinball champion and <laughs> a uh, religious messiah in the UK. The UK seems like a crazy place. Yeah, man, the um, LSD was I'll strong confess. with them when they were coming up with this uh, <laughs> concept. Good lord. Yeah, well, and and, and it, worth noting again, this is directed by uh, Ken Russell, who's someone we've talked about on the show before. We've talked about The Devils, which is one of our Great probably film. our favorite films that we've talked about on oh, the show, yeah. and one of the most unhinged depictions of the Catholic Church's relationship to politics and violence and yeah. sexual oppression and all kinds That's of stuff. Right. But we we've also talked about altered states which is like mm. an it's very yeah. existential sci-fi that has like freak out sequences that remind yeah. us a little bit of like holy mountain a little bit of cronenberg in there mm. and then we also talked about crimes of passion which is uh, sort of like yet. 80s erotic thriller taken to like these slasher extremes with anthony perkins in it it reminded me something of like um i think olivia was the pairing on that film but it also reminded me of something like dress to kill a little bit to palma Definitely. um i always think about that scene in that film where perkins like goes into to the peep show and just starts like going fucking insane. And the camera is just so <laughs> like, it's so stylistically nuts. And it was funny that, it, that craziness of crimes of passion that he got to in kind of like the eighties, that is more <laughs> what this kind of reminded me of in terms of the sort of like bombastic, crazy, uh, like glam surface, yeah. um, of this movie. But it's crazy because it came out like, you know, shortly after the devils, honestly, like this is like a mid seventies, film and I was sitting here thinking more of sort of like Ken Russell's 80s even though you know I won't say that the devils was like a chill film by any means it's <laughs> very frenzied and 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 yeah but it, it's, erratic it's in like, its own way <laughs> it doesn't if I'm remembering correctly yeah it's, it's like yeah you're right so yeah <laughs> no, it, it, but it, you know, it's just like the, very interesting to see sort of like the progression of of Ken yeah. Russell, and, and also that apparently, according you know, according I don't you know, it's hard to tell how true half the information is on the internet about this stuff. Apparently, Ken Russell was not crazy about the music, which is crazy when you think about it. That, that he you know, still he decided made a- to make it. I, an entire opera film where it's literally yeah. front to back, nothing but music and you don't like the music. Like you would think that that would be troubling for you as a filmmaker, but apparently he was just obsessed with the actual story that they came up with this idea of sort of cults and messiahs and the industry around it and the way that they sort of exploit people and how he could take that to obviously some visual extremes. And, you know, he had a, a vision for how to achieve that story. And so he rewrote Uh, bits of the album to kind of fill in some of the sort of like plot blanks that he thought existed between the songs. And he worked with Townsend from the who um, for basically like a year on this screenplay trying to, you know, just get it to like kind of work perfectly. And also he changed the time period, obviously, because I think the songs are the first world war and this one was moved to the second world war. And so there's a couple things. I think he did that just so that by the end of the film, he was in the seventies. He was in the modern day. He really wanted to right. to comment on the now a little bit in terms of, you know, sort of, you know, uh, religion and commercialization and cults and things of this nature. But uh, yeah, this movie's fucking crazy is the the high and low of it, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, this was I think this was all of our first time watching it. Um and uh, I was just absolutely taken with how this movie is, uh, you know, basically two hours long, and it m- just moves like crazy from yeah, song to song, from just, set piece to set piece, mm-hmm. mini little no, song no shorts, air. very little dead air, just like, <laughs> but in like a good way, like in a very good way that just keeps you engaged and like, and, and, and consistently just sort of like. I don't know, surprised by the direction the story, you know, the scenes go in or just the, the, all the crazy sets and costumes and yeah, I mean, he, uh, production he, design. 
he kind of puts the tone like it. in place mm-hmm. like right away with the uh like that beautiful silhouetted sunrise that's happening with the man like it just automatically mm-hmm. gives this kind of fantastic and uh surreal feeling that that pretty yeah, much goes through the it's like he opens mm-hmm. he opens and he closes the film with the sunrise <laughs> right too, right mm-hmm. yeah yeah great way to bookend it yeah, absolutely. But also well, well, yeah, because like by, by by the end too, you know, again, this is a very visually accomplished film, obviously, yeah. but also like by the by the end, like that that arc is like very clear of how yeah. the movie opens on kind of like this, you know, this real beautiful mountainside picnic where this the, there's these couple, you know, making love next to a waterfall, <laughs> and they're about to, um, you know, obviously conceive of this kid. Tommy and then the father goes you know goes gets called to war and there's this Mm -hmm. whole thing where like literally their their love is interrupted by this war zone and their house is on fire and they're literally like running from their house into the the, like rubble and like there's like people (laughs) trying to put out the fire on their house and you know she's she's hearing um uh bombs being dropped while she's in like a bed that's also like a cage and the visual storytelling here is just insane as she like reaches Mm -hmm. for the photo as he's shot down out of his plane and Mm -hmm. she they find out that you know he she's giving birth to tommy meanwhile the father you know they essentially think that he's dead and then it's moving on and oliver reed obviously from the devil shows up and he's fucking singing uh <laughs> dude his introduction when uh well i guess yeah. it's not his very first thing but when he he does there's this sign because they're doing this like leg competition and lovely he just, leg mm-hmm. ladies yeah right, and he right. joined, it's like it pans and it's his legs and he hops yeah. out and he's like a little thing it's, to the camera that was funny yeah it's such a funny introduction <laughs> to his character especially knowing yeah. like now how really truly evil the character is uh, just to have yeah. this kind of like upbeat uh, and fun introduction. But also just like it. knowing that actor in the roles, the types of roles he usually plays, I yes. feel like he's usually very threatening yes. or like imposing or just like. Yeah, you know, I, I always think of the devil. And, 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 and in the this brood. movie, in this movie, he's just like, he's also, you know, he's threatening, but he's fucking hilarious. Yeah. He's yeah. just like, he just gives these like looks to the cat, he smiles, and it's the funniest thing. <laughs> it's just like. He was like yeah. great in the movie. <laughs> yeah, he's fantastic. Yeah, I, I, like, I love a lot of the sort of like wide angle close ups they do of his face while he's like yeah. shouting into the camera and like obviously, <laughs> you know, not known for his his singing skill. And I know that yeah. the band was not super uh, pleased with the casting. <laughs> you know, it was kind of like the the original Russell Crowe and Les Mis moment where they kind of just chose yeah. him because of his 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 acting ability <laughs> and his look over you know his his skill. His um, but but honestly, yeah, I fair. I still enjoyed Oliver read um because honestly he doesn't have to sing as much as you no. think and also you know he does look like this imposing kind of like evil uncle stepfather yeah he um, has the physicality type. for it he, he pulls the the physical performance off really well that the voice for me didn't it just made it it was funny like i just didn't you know like it didn't like detract from my like enjoyment of what I was watching. It was just like, Oh yeah, his singing's a bit weird, but that's yeah. fine. Cause he's a bit weird, a character. So it's like, yeah, you know, it fits. I, I did see him in certain points as kind of like unhinged. So having a, a, some of the vocals be a little bit off, didn't uh, mm-hmm. like it didn't, it didn't make me think that it wasn't kind of a part of the film and the music. Yeah, no, it felt like it felt like that was, you know, it could be seen as intentional or, you know, or, you know, not, not, not necessarily like a mistake. Right, yeah, right, definitely, right. definitely part of the character in in, yeah. in kind of a way, especially I, when he starts going like crazy and like he like kills <laughs> when they find out that the father has come back and he kills the father yeah, kills with, the, a, yeah. with, a, with with the with the lamp the and bulb. he starts going, "What about the boy? He saw it." All. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that I think some of the the vocal work in this is a little bit strained at times. I understand yeah. that they're not yeah. they don't have like the the production that we have now, and they didn't even want to do that mm-hmm. back then. So I. And yeah. I'm, I'm for that, of course. Um, it's just that there were a couple vocal yeah. takes. I feel like they could have maybe taken a second or third take on and gotten That's some fair. better tone. Uh, but mm-hmm. um, but overall, <laughs> most of the time when that happened, I did think that it kind of suited the, the character. Uh, even though just in rare moments, it was a little bit grating on the ears. Um, but once again, yeah. it kind of it does wrap up with the character a bit. So it's. It was hard for me to say. I was kind of battling myself a little bit through. Like, well, yeah. Well, and and also it's worth noting that obviously for this film they re-recorded the entire album. 
which right. was something mm-hmm. that they ad- initially didn't intend to do, but then they did it because they wanted it to match the visual material. So obviously some of the production in general is not the same that they did for the album. And they, they even rewrote some of the songs a tiny bit to make them work for the film and everything like mm-hmm. that. So a lot of this was kind of like rewritten and reproduced for the film and re-recorded, obviously, because a lot of the actors themselves are singing it, even though, you know, both Daltrey and Townsend are on, are, are singing in the film. I think Daltrey, from the who is um singing all of tommy's stuff yeah um yeah and then townsend is doing all of the uh the narration um okay. you know f- uh, the, the the sort of uh disembodied uh narr- vocal narration that comes through uh in the film that's not being sung by like you know frank or the mother mm-hmm. or jack nicholson right. or tina turner yeah. or you know various sort of cameo uh, uh yeah. actors that <laughs> and, and, and musicians that show up um throughout the film what are, um, what are, but uh, the thing th- I was going to ask, okay. what, are, what are some of your, like, just because we're t- discussing the music uh, in general now, like, what are some of your favorite um, uh, pieces? Because for me, it's obvious, like, Pinball Wizard is, is a given because it's Pinball Wizard's the fucking crazy, single. Yeah, it's amazing. And also, yeah, also yeah, it's one of the Pinball craziest Wizard sequences. Is like the highlight. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then also <laughs> uh, the Tina Turner Acid Queen is obviously that very good. That song is sick. Yeah. Yeah. I will say, yeah. though, yeah. I found myself... Um, I wasn't in love with kind of the more musical, I don't want to call it filler. It's just, it it felt like uh, they had songs that, we're kind of more in their uh, rock sound that they're that they're used to, and I know this is a rock mm-hmm. opera, so they're they're kind of differentiating it a little bit. But for me, some of the stuff that was just telling the story itself, like the plot-heavy songs, I found them to be a little bit uh, repetitive and not as exciting as the other ones, like Pinball Wizard, Acid Queen. I think there's a couple others I'd have to list, list off. But what did you what did you guys think of the more musical aspect of it rather than the rock and roll aspect of it for the music? Um, honestly, I, I, uh, in, enjoyed a lot of the music. Like, obviously nice. there's highlights, like there's ones that yeah. stand out that are more, um, you know, sort of in terms of both the production and the lyrics, like more ambitious. Um, yeah. but uh, for, for me, anything that was sort of, I was let down musically with usually the visuals carried it over for me Yeah, or, see, or at least thing. I, I, I saw, I saw like what they were going for. And I, the thing, it's hard to judge because what I would have to do is I'd have to listen to the album again I, to see exactly what different differences that they made because I'm curious what they changed so that it worked better as a visual musical thing where they were actually trying because I know that a lot of the rewrites they did do were to sort of clarify plotting and character and stuff that he felt like the album didn't um, you know uh, cohesively sort of get to but I, I would say that you know like even stuff like you know just like uh, Oliver Reed and the mother played by Anne Margaret um just like singing about how they are going to make the kid uh, basically like deaf and dumb and blind yeah, and, right. and and stuff like that. And how, and, and you know, even if musically it's not like the most Im- impressive song, um, the actual sequence itself where he, you know, where Oliver Reed is like taking him on the fair ride and he's like shooting down planes that have his dad on them. And there's just crazy lights and sparkles right. and tacky shirts and animation. And like, it becomes this whole thing where there's like this black box on his head that spins and he's in like mm-hmm. funhouse mirrors and you know, his, uh, there's the, the, there's the psychedelic quality um, to it that carried it for me, even if, you know, the song wasn't the most interesting yeah. song. Because, yeah, you know, not every song on here is, a, you know, a, a huge hit. I think that's unfortunately yeah. a part of rock operas is yeah, they have to tell lot stories. Um, and there's, you know, sometimes that's not necessarily the best for the creative freedom um, of the, the album musically. I mean, some people obviously have done it incredibly, but it's just, you know. Um, it's tough. Yeah, it, it's not the easiest thing. And also, I, you know, I wouldn't go to bat and say that this is like the best music or album I've ever heard. That's for sure. No, right. No, yeah. No. <laughs> I mean, it's not that at all. It just It's more the combination of, you know, what you were saying, the combination of the music and the visuals and the story and the whole yeah. presentation of it all is what sort of makes it. Uh, like if you take any element individually, probably you could find issues and imperfections, but because it's it's just, it's presented in like, yeah, yeah, and and and, 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 and I, I like, like some of the and, and yeah, I, I, visually I like some, engaging way. It just it saves the whole thing and it makes it like a fucking awesome movie. 
<laughs> yeah, well, and I, I also really liked some of the um, repetitive qualities that I think Jamie was talking about a little bit. Like some mm-hmm. of the ones, like for example, um, where you know they, they find out that you know they actually did you know through the psychedelic sequence actually fuck with Tommy's senses and they basically like destroyed him and he can't see and he can't hear and yeah. They kind of deal with the guilt of that because the reason they did it, obviously, was they wanted to cover up the murder that they committed, which, by the way, is one of the big changes from the album to the movie, um, is that I think the father comes back and kills Frank, but Ken Russell wanted this to be a little bit more of a darker thing where the parents are more culpable than on the album. So he so he made it where Frank kills the father and the mother was actually more complicit in the killing as well. Right. Um, right. So that, you know, there's a lot more guilt for the mother character when you get to her big sequence. But like the Mm -hmm. early sequences that are just straight up musical numbers pretty much where, you know, where they're talking about how Tommy doesn't know what day it is or what Jesus is. So how can he be saved? And they're, you know, they're dealing with Mm -hmm. this contradiction of like, how are you supposed to be part of the world and one with the world if you literally can't engage with it or sense it in any way? And there's a party. Yeah. There's this whole party happening around this kid who can't see or hear anything. And the mother's mm-hmm. going, and uh, and Oliver Reed are both going, Tommy, can you hear me? Right. And you get these amazing things that come back throughout the rest of the film, which is like these little, little interior um, moments of Tommy reaching out to them, and you just yeah. get uh, you just get Daltrey, who obviously Im- really impressive singer. So it's really nice when when Tommy actually sings the songs. Yeah. I think some yeah. of those are the best songs, definitely. But the little bits where he's like, "Feel me, <laughs> touch me." Yeah. heal me and all of that stuff just kind of happening and it's like a close up on the mother and all of her guilt and she can just hear her son in her head and the way that the you know Ken Russell obviously mm-hmm. shoots that and, and then there's like images of like it zooming in and out on him while they're like honking trumpets in his face while oh, that's happening yeah. and stuff it's so sick and the way that he shoots yeah. it too like, like a, and half the time it's a this... track with the trumpets kind of and it's like really weird <laughs> Like half the time in this movie too, Daltrey is just staring into the camera. So whenever he's doing stuff like the touch me, feel me stuff, it makes it also seem like he's directly singing to you a lot of the time, Mm -hmm. which just gives this weird, surreal feeling of like you're a part of this crazy adventure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, And then obviously, too, you know, there's I think some people, you know, I think that some people think that obviously the the movie is a, a little bit too long and takes a couple detours. But but for me, I also found a lot of the detours just like really delightful. Like, again, you get Tina Turner trying to cure him with acid. Uh, you get this amazing part where um they they go to uh, Eric Clapton's rock and roll church, <laughs> where uh, he has started a cult uh, about the uh, uh, basically in regards to Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> yeah, and there and there's like their Jesus statue is of her doing the skirt thing with the wind. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, and there and there's like shots of like the mirrored upskirt stuff, and they're yeah. like kissing her feet, and then there's rack focus on the reflections uh, of yeah. of her on top of like Eric Clapton's guitar playing and stuff like that, like really crazy. Um, stuff yeah, that they do where, 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 it, where it fits in, where they, you know, Ken Russell has, has made it be like, okay, so these are the attempts to, you know, try to cure him. One, they try to do it with, you know, sort of like, uh, they try to do it with acid. That doesn't work. Then they take him to, you know, a, a cult where they, where they try to heal him. And then, you know, I, I, I had heard this album before, but I, I had never picked up on it. You know, how literal, I guess yeah. so much of it is meant to be. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so watching it literalized in such a crazy style like this, I was like, it, it, it took me a while to come around and, and, and realize that this whole cult thing was actually going to come back um, yeah. because of the kind of journey that it, that it takes you on. But again, some of the imagery that they, they came up with for this of like Tina Turner, like giant close-ups of like her lips quivering while she's performing and then yeah. she's like turning into like a, like a giant, like a, uh, d- d- syringe filled with like mysterious red liquid it's like an iron maiden an iron maiden (laughs) yeah Yeah, it's so wild it's Mm. so and then there's like four tinas and six tinas dancing around and she's like screaming like i'm the gypsy acid queen and stuff like that and the rooms and the sets seem so like like they have that kind of uh separation from reality a lot of the time and a Mm -hmm. lot of it is because of the camera angles that russell tends to use like it's always 
very um, like like Dutch angles and and weird uh, lenses to make the room seem wider than it is and yeah and things like that. Like it, it just there's a constant surreal feeling to everything. And and what I found like really impressive is how different every single set was and every single little. A piece of music is with the like connecting with the visuals every scene mm-hmm. in this is is very different uh even when it comes to the like uh like what russell's doing with the camera mm-hmm. it, it, on a technical yeah. level there, there's just so much going on here in every single yeah. scene definitely so definitely well, cause, cause, variety throughout. oh yeah yeah, well, because I mean, like, again, it, it it starts off, you know, just like this sort of like wartime romance that then becomes this really twisted relationship with the mother and Oliver Reed, which then becomes them killing the father, uh, overloading the kid's senses so that they basically, you know, make him, you know, uh, unable to rat them out for the murder that they did. And then they try to, like, heal him, but they can't take him to, like, a real doctor because they don't want to say what happened. So they take him to all these crazy places. And then... It, it all turns out that he ends up wa- following a vision of himself to a junkyard where he finds a pinball machine and he he becomes <laughs> the master of uh, of of pinball. And then that was when the style of the movie clarified itself to me, too. Yeah, because you have the junkyard, but then the junkyard, as he starts playing pinball, is lit up in all the neon crazy colors of the actual arcade machine that he's playing on. And mm-hmm. then it's and then it jumps into he's immediately a superstar Frank and his mother um, both basically go, oh, holy shit, we can monetize this. Our child is like a fucking prodigy at, at pinball. And then it goes time. right in. Yeah, and then it goes straight into Pinball Wizard where you have fucking Elton John in like 15 foot <laughs> yeah. tall boots. Such a banger <laughs> of a scene. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. Well, and, and and all of the style just replicates like the shiny little pinball hitting all of these various shiny reflective surfaces and crazy lights. And the the actual sequence itself is basically the same thing, but like on a stage. And just Elton John just belting down at Daltrey, who just can't see or hear anything. So he just like he's staring into the dis- yeah. distance. Elton John just looking down at him from his twenty foot boots, screaming. It's fucking crazy. And yeah. then mm-hmm. all the different like spinning shots through the stage and the, you know they actually have the who as the backup band like shredding their guitars and smashing shit <laughs> yeah in true yeah. who form which was very awesome yeah. to see. well I, I, and too we we skipped over um they try to there's a, a a really horrifying montage where they they try the parents are you know um again very abusive to him so they just set him up with babysitters while they go out yeah. and there's a part where they set him up with like a with a, a a bully who there's just a montage of this dude just like uh, you know, like hanging him on the walls and beating the mm-hmm. shit out of him, and then they have um who who's the uh, Keith Moon yeah. shows up um as <laughs> Uncle Ernie yeah. who is is like literally just like this child molester, and yeah. they have like a whole sequence where that happens. It, it. <laughs> and he's like, and talking about like sets like that yellow house room hallway all that was like very just like effective <laughs> yeah weird and eerie <laughs> Yeah, very. Yeah, very, yeah, and, and 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 you have them, you know, the mothers singing about. Can I? Do you think that it's okay to leave him with this baby <laughs> babysitter? And all of Oliver Reed's just like, yeah, I think it's all right. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> whatever, do it. I wouldn't think the, about the, it. the cousin. The cousins like got like this Nazi uh, iconography um, on him. He's putting spikes on the toilet seat. Um, mm-hmm. He's uh, <laughs> the most sadistic psycho school bully that you've you've ever seen, or maybe that's just again what living in the UK is like. I've seen those <laughs> Alan Clark movies about British Borstal schools, so this just might be <laughs> what what living there is like. Um, but yeah, just really really crazy um, stuff that it almost goes like full like horror movie mode with the lighting and everything. As you know, like this uncle is like molesting him, and you think that would be just like a like a really weird detail to include. But you gotta credit. I mean, you know, both obviously, you know, for uh, you know having some of that stuff on the album, but then also the way that Ken Russell circles that back and eventually brings back the child molesting uncle as someone yeah. who's part of the religious group. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because Ken Russell can't not get the Catholic Church involved. He's just like, <laughs> oh, uh, you know, a, a, a church organization hiring a child molester to entertain all the children. That would never happen. <laughs> um, 
and and yeah so the, the I, I think that is what kind of ended up surprising me the most because again the music is is really kind of goofy and insane and ken russell matches it you know with a with a sense of uh, stylistic uh bomb bombastic quality that he definitely gets in on all the the flash and the shine of the surface glam of you know m- adapting a rock opera that seems inherent to that but i was surprised at how thematically seriously he actually takes the concerns of the album, which I mean, obviously Especially- Daltrey always talked about, you know, he, he, he described it as an attack on the hypocrisy of, of organized um, religion. And, you know, I, I think that in some cases the album kind of is that, but I've even heard criticism that, you know, that kind of stuff is kind of like underbaked in the actual album and that it's, you know, not as thoroughly explored, but yeah. Ken Russell, obviously knowing you know, the kind of things that attracts him to material and him literally saying, I didn't make this because of the music. I made it because of the subject matter. Um, he really finds ways to make that subject matter hit hard and harder than you would expect and, this, and, and use the overwhelming overblown style to kind of get at, you know, how people are absorbed into, you know, that kind mm-hmm. of cult by that flash, by that surface. Yeah, and I find it funny, too, that he's able to do this. He's able to convince you of kind of like the evils of the cult and all that while simultaneously having shots of, of a half-naked Richard Daltrey running through a yellow flowered field <laughs> and then having yes. like all these green screens where he's running to like every country in the entire world yes. cut to him uh, hang gliding yeah. and singing. The uh, hang gliding oh singing. Uh, when when, 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 the, when it's, my it cuts to the reveal <laughs> of him flying in and singing, yeah. I laughed my ass off. Lost it's my so shit. Funny. Lost my <laughs> shit. And somehow they still keep like this sincerity to all of this absolute insanity. Um, mm-hmm. And that was something that I I really did click with. Um, even when, like I said earlier, like the the music wasn't working quite as much. That all of the visuals, all of the just insane ideas that he was somehow able to put forth and, and it works was just uh, yeah. endlessly impressive. So like, yeah, it, to, to balance those things is, is very difficult. I imagine. Uh, yeah. It, it, I think the movie, um, you know, if, if we want to hit on a couple more um, sequences before yeah. we get to kind of like the big, big finale, I think one of the, um, the absolute, uh, greatest sequences um, in the film. And I don't even know that I would say it like it's not one of my favorite songs, but it's one of my favorite scenes actually in the film is um, uh, Anne Margaret when she finds out that she, she's watching him on TV. Basically, oh, yeah. uh, he, he fucking kills Elton John <laughs> <laughs> by like exploding the fucking lights on the stage and everything like himself, essentially. And the mother's like getting drunk and watching. And she's really proud that, you know, her son is this genius that's been born again. And, you know, he's going to provide the whole family with wealth and fame. But obviously there's this sort of like original sin quality to what her and, you know, the fact that this is only happening to him because of the pain that they inflicted their own um, mm-hmm. child with. And she's actually very kind of like up, upset that, you know, what, what is, is having all of this worth it if my son, um, you know, can't see the, or hear the things that I'm, I'm, I'm buying for him. And she said, she basically like screams with guilt that she'd pay any money to drive this blight from her mind, not even to fix the thing that she's done, but to just not feel so terribly kind of like guilty over the whole thing. But then the things that she's watching on TV literally explode like into the white yeah. room, this lavish room that she's, uh, you know, uh, dancing around in. And that's also when the, um, uh, Daltrey, Tommy, see me, feel me, touch me, heal me stuff starts coming back <laughs> in while she's screaming and like throwing the remote and the bubbles start leaking out of the TV, which then yeah, becomes then beans that, like, coming beans out of the TV and, and she's like rubbing them on herself. Yeah. herself there's like three <laughs> minutes of this woman just rolling around in beans yeah it's it grossed yeah. me out a little <laughs> oh yeah, yeah was, i mean uh, they definitely had to burn that room after there was no cleaning that oh, oh the yeah. smell <laughs> yeah that must have been a very memorable day on set for a couple days i don't know how long <laughs> Yeah, beans all over the white room and the art and the, the the mirror and the bed and she's just like fucking rolling around in it like fucking really uh, really gross stuff and apparently uh, came from the fact that one of the Who's albums that was called the the Who Sells Out 
And one of the uh, covers they came up with for that was uh, Daltrey with a can of Heinz beans, like promoting it. So they were like, for some reason, Heinz beans was considered like selling out or commercial. So that's why it comes through the TV. It's, so it's it's literally the the, the commercial qualities of of her wealth uh, coming through the TV and literally like, like drowning, drowning her. her. Beans. Yeah, yeah. consuming her. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Jack Nicholson at one point shows up as a doctor. Oh, yeah. that was, yeah. that was, I was like, when he first showed up, I was like, oh no, is he is he gonna have a voice? And then his voice wasn't like terrible. I was shocked. I mean, it wasn't that like, it. Yeah, no, they, they 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 said that they were um, that the the Who was kind of annoyed having to work with Oliver Reed because I guess Oliver Reed didn't they they didn't know that he would struggle so hard to sing. I, I think they say they they like what they got out of him, but they said that it was a lot of work. He had to do yeah, tons bet. of takes I to bet. get the few scenes they got from him. <laughs> they said when so they were annoyed when Ken Russell also cast Jack Nicholson. They were like, he shows up for like one actor. scene and he sings perfectly okay. <laughs> yeah, and then they actually came in and they basically did it in a take. They were like, "Yeah, Jack Nicholson can actually sing." They were fine. <laughs> yeah, I was shocked because I've never heard his voice, and I don't know if he's yeah, ever really either. recorded anything else. So, but yeah, he he can carry a tune. I was pleasantly mm-hmm. surprised. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, they they basically you know confirm what we've known this entire time, which is that you know there there's nothing really physically wrong with, right, with yeah, Tommy. It's yeah. it's you know a sort of mental and psychological state that his, his parents have 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 put him um, into, and um, eventually he he does get healed because the mother like you know, confronts him in, in the mirror and like throws him through the mirror. And he has that big awakening sequence where he's coming in on the hang glider (laughs) and he's (laughs) running, he's, he's running through the, the oceans and the mountains and the skies and, you know, everything like that. Um, and he's been delivered, um, from, from silent darkness, uh, into the, the, the brand new world where he has found enlightenment. Um, no more locked doors or stifled screams. I think he sings at one point. And what he has felt, what he has discovered, it's even bigger than pinball, even bigger than <laughs> pinball fever, which is Can you imagine? That, you know, which is the thing that that made him rich. But now he wants to be Christ. And he throws <laughs> away, you know, he throws away all of his mother's material things, her necklaces her bracelets her her rings. And there's headlines. Tommy speaks pinball <laughs> Jesus. And he's got <laughs> photo shoots and mansions. And, you know, he's he's the new. Um, Messiah that young girls go to his concerts and I love, they have photos plastered of him everywhere. I love his poster because he's like hugging himself and then he's got the halo above him and all that. Yes. <laughs> it's so just like like ego driven and it's 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 fantastic. And then the shot of the the girl when it's showing like his fandom taking over, how she has a wallpaper that's just his face over and over and over yes. again. Oh yeah. It's just oh, a really yeah. Good I was details. like, oh my god, that whole sequence, that whole sequence with the little girl, I was like, where is this going? Where is where is this going? Where is this going? And then the it's, second uh, that that uh, Oliver Reed just like kicks her in the face, I was like, oh okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then and yeah, then they have uh, uh, adultery. of all the places. I did not expect the sort of like glam rock gospel concert that she goes to, and you know, it's obviously all about you know sort of like how music and 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 rock can kind of sort of like you know pick up the the sort of youth of of the day yeah. and all the little all the little girls are fucking going crazy and screaming and she gets pulled out like bleeding i did not expect that sequence to end with her marrying a rock and roll oh, Einstein yeah. and having his baby at the concert <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's right definitely definitely did not see that coming i love no. by the way i love daltrey's microphone the fact that it's a crucifix that turns into a microphone as he's wearing yeah. it just just these small little prop details in there too are fantastic well yeah and, stage. and i was gonna say crucifix t imagery yeah, yeah i was gonna say did, did you notice that it's literally a t for tommy with a yeah. ball on top of it yeah that's like yeah that's the, the humor of it it's just like it's using so these like <laughs> things but also creating a religious imagery out of it yeah 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 well and, and then, then he starts rounding up like frustrated workers and you know people who are mm-hmm. turning to crime, and he starts you know trying to give them all a place place to live uh, through through his uh, his uh, vibrating sensations is how he describes them. <laughs> um, you'll you'll feel him coming. 
<laughs> and he, he brings in milkmen and bakers and little old ladies and he invites them all uh, into the house and Oliver Reed's going, there's more at the door. I can't contain them all. There's so um, many extras but, in this too. Like the in yeah. the background as he's going, like he's walking through the, uh, I think like the courtyard or the front yard of the house and there's just so many people in the background and it's just, it just feels very uh, massive in scale and elaborate. It's It's great. So he really used the hell out of. I, mean, I think I read five million dollar budget. I don't know how accurate that is, but like, okay. I mean, yeah, the that, movie looks incredible. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it looks absolutely. like it. You know, it looks like it has a lot of production value to it. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. They, they did some really great location work, but then they also built, yeah. um, you and know, like the, the holiday, some of the holiday camp stuff. Mm-hmm. And I, I love that moment where, because early on in the film, when you're first introduced to Frank, they meet him on like a uh, like a vacation thing, right? And he basically says that he his dream is to like literally just start up like a camp. Like he loves the idea of everyone just like <laughs> hanging out and being a family. It's like the only sort of like redeeming quality he has is that he has this dream of this camp. Right. And yeah. when 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 yeah. he finally realizes that he's gonna get to build that camp for Tommy because they need more space for the people. And Oliver yeah. Reed just gives like the biggest smirk in the world. Yeah. And he's just like, he's going to get that fucking camp. And now there's going to be, you know, he's going to sell teas. He's going to sell vinyl. You know, he's going to, you know, they, they've started their own cult. That's just like the Marilyn Monroe one where everyone went to, um, mm-hmm try and heal their relatives by touching the Marilyn Monroe statue that didn't work. And my favorite detail is that it's literally the same fucking people who go to the Marilyn Monroe cult and didn't <laughs> get healed. They're the ones showing mm-hmm. up to the Tommy cult now. This will work. Yeah. Uh, who are all like waiting in line in the wheelchairs mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And that's when you also get like Uncle Ernie playing the piano for everyone. And you're like, no, why is yeah. the child like this? Like, uh, <laughs> it's like his piano uh, here, or whatever. Yeah, and and this is where like the the more satirical craziness comes into it because it's really sharp at this point where it's just like mm-hmm. how easy the sort of like real traumatic experience that Tommy went through and his sort of like very real kind of uh, awakening that he had and how the industry and bad actors immediately formed around him to both exploit and commercialize all of those things that he experienced and try to sell them to other people. And just how obviously, like, obviously garish and cynical um, Mm -hmm. that is. And obviously how absurd um, it is. And, you know, uh, Russell handles that with all the garishness and absurdity of of his actual (laughs) style while depicting that. And as they're, like, selling posters and clothes and demanding enlightenment um, from him while they're all walking through a mountain of giant pinballs. (laughs) (laughs) He he takes it, like, really fucking far. And they at one point, they all start rioting and breaking the pinball machines and everything. And they rise up and literally kill his mother and Frank and like stab yeah. and smash bottles on them casting away their false idols that are just the the parents of this pinball messiah <laughs> just it's really crazy when you start to say, describe it yeah like I was oh, like, yeah. What, are you, oh, like yeah. what are you even describing I've seen this movie <laughs> it's just it's so absurd it's it's unbelievable mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and, and my, my favorite aspect of that is when Tommy wakes up and, you know, all of his, you know, followers have thrown him away and literally killed his parents right in front of him. And, you know, he's trying to kind of, like, figure out yeah, what's just happened. Yeah, that one last, do you feel, or you feel me, you touch me? Pretty sure that comes back, right? When yep, yep. It definitely then, comes back, but also the visual of him just climbing out of the fake mountain of pinballs and back <laughs> onto the real mountain where his parents like actually conceived him and he sees the waterfall and the sun rises in the same way it did on yeah. his dad in the opening shot. And, um, you know, he, he's singing this really powerful song where he's just like, you know, you know, he's like, I, I see the glory from you. I get opinions from you. I get the story. Uh, listening to you, I get the music. Gazing at you, I get the heat. Following you, I climb the mountain. I get excitement at your feet. Uh, is is what he's kind of singing over and over again as he kind of returns back to you know these this actual real natural thing that is like the opposite of you know this you know this very fake commercialized uh, mm-hmm. you know cult that he's built up. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it, it really like comes full circle with you know. Um, uh, everything that kind of came um, before it, and and he he returns back to you know this this actual you know this this real place where real love happened. 
<laughs> after right. all of that craziness mm-hmm. that he's been on where you know his his parents then you know uh, uh, abused him and exploited him and then you know he became you know the uh this 1970s uh jesus christ <laughs> pinball, <of> pinball jesus <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> that's yeah, what it should have been called that, right uh, there all of that i think uh really really works and i think that russell again um you know the way that he depicts that as this visual odyssey that it's very dizzying and he sweeps you along and kind of takes you on um you know the same kind of uh journey that the people who get swept up in that kind of thing go on i i realized later that like the whole middle section is just you getting swept up into the kind of bombastic commercial qualities um that uh you know they they use to get the audience he gets in the first place and ken mm-hmm. russell even described it that that was an intentional thing that he wanted to do that he was like this is going to be my most commercial film um and it, it's about you know commercialism and he was like that's yeah. exactly why i wanted to do it and i mean yeah i think that's also why it works so well is because it all like it, it's bombastic but it's bombastic with like a point it's like Mm-hmm. Everything is, you know, it's taking a lot of things that seem very out of elements that seem disparate and combined. You know, it is very absurd, but like it's also the subject matter is absurd. It's the world that we live in. It's absurd. It's like, you know, yeah, I <laughs> like just the, the nature of celebrity now, yeah. like, you know, like the way people blow up and, and get big it's like it might as well just be playing pinball you know (laughs) yes yeah (laughs) definitely if anything nowadays i'd prefer pinball champions to be the celebrities i think they deserve a little more i'd be down for watching (laughs) insane pinball runs yeah (laughs) yeah yeah well uh pivoting towards a reductive rating round on on this one i think which for you jared is where we remove all the words all the nuance and reduce the movie between a number between uh one and five this one gets a gets a a solid four from me i think because yeah same um again i i think you know i i'd have to listen to the album again um Mm -hmm. to to be uh, like a hundred percent certain but like i definitely have heard sort of like mixed things about you know how the album kind of realizes um its themes and that townsend you know might have bit off a little bit more than they could have um you know chewed and you know but and and i i can see that there might be a fault with some of the music but for me ken russell just made me believe every second of the ridiculousness and its goofier qualities and he just said fuck it like let's really go for it i have to (laughs) respect that that he he took this thing that he didn't even care for that much and genuinely turned it into like this pop art odyssey um Mm kind of thing that might even realize the themes better um and you know revealing how easy it is to be absorbed by commercial surfaces and Mm -hmm. You know, uh, with the style just getting so um, inventive and psychedelic to the point of of exhaustion and just fanatically overblown and while also never losing sight of these, you know, very tough themes of of, of abuse and religion and exploitation and commercialization Mm -hmm. and, you know, replicating all of those experiences through – the style and yeah, ultimately I was quite surprised. I, I, you know, I'd heard about this film and I had seen that it's not like one of Ken Russell's most beloved films by any means, but I was like surprised at how genuinely it explored through real opera, (laughs) the experiences of, you know, uh, you know, uh, taking real, uh, suffering and, and exploiting it and commercializing it and how that relates to religion and everything. Um, yeah. and, and some of the details obviously that, that he included, um, throughout that and some of the ways he depicted through horror, almost, uh, the various ways that, you know, the, the parents mistreat the child and the way that the child gets turned into this, you know, this, this mythical celebrity image that people latch onto. It's, it's all very well done. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I would, I would agree with, with all of that for me, I guess I'm, I'm right now at that like extremely high three, uh, that just doesn't quite break the four for me yet, but it really what it is, is it's the music for me. Uh, it's not that I dislike it mm-hmm. in any way. Uh, the hits are awesome. Like when it hits, I, I really enjoyed it. Like, like, like I said, pinball wizard acid queen are two ones that really stand out to me. Um, it's just some of the, the more musical numbers where they're doing more plot stuff that I just kind of, uh, 
I wouldn't say I, tur- I turned off because the visuals are just so impressive throughout the entire film. Like, uh, like Ken Russell really brings this uh, to, a, to a higher level uh, than I think it would be. Um, it's just that when a movie is a musical, uh, it's, it's really hard for me to fully engage if I'm not also fully engaged with the music. But that being mm-hmm. said, I'm definitely going to revisit this um, because I think I'm going to take to it better the second time just knowing all of its context and, and what Russell mm-hmm. was doing. Um, a couple of things I just wanted to mention that I thought were interesting was that uh, Mick Jagger was actually going to be the Acid Queen. Uh, which oh, wow. I think would have been a really interesting um, take just vocally. I think yeah. Tina Turner ended up being the better choice in a way. But yeah, Jagger I like would have been her good. more. But, yeah, but yeah it's it, an interesting choice for sure. And it's funny, too, because the I guess one of the reasons he didn't get it was because he insisted he wanted to have three of his own individual <laughs> songs. So uh, Jagger's <laughs> ego got in, into play there a little yeah. bit. Uh, and apparently also Tiny Tim was set to play the pinball wizard, which got to Elton John. And I don't know if you guys have heard Tiny Tim's <laughs> voice, but he's famous. I have. Right. He's yeah, he's famous for the uh, what's that movie? I think it's the um, Insidious where it's like that that ukulele song and it's got the high-pitched vocals that's really creepy that's tiny tim so i just can't imagine him doing pinball wizard but that would have been something to see um uh, yeah, yeah for for, for, I, for for some something tiny like, tim at like the movies at the window, experience the, people need to check the, out sorry. um uh blood harvest 1987 tiny tim oh, plays yeah. uh just just plays a clown that's why and uh you he he plays the the biggest red he- herring in cinematic history because it's a slasher horror film and obviously you're like okay well the clown is doing it right <laughs> um but i won't i won't spoil it but yeah <laughs> nice and then uh yeah one one more little fact just that i read that i thought was really funny before i wrap it up is that one of the reasons elton john agreed to do the pinball wizard scene uh was so that or, or in order for him to do it he got to keep the dr martin boots that he wore <laughs> Because that dude Hell just yeah. has such style. So yeah, for now it's going to be a, a high three. But I really do think this could uh, this could get the upgrade on on a rewatch because I love Ken Russell's direction in this. Mm-hmm. Um, it's unbelievably insane uh, in the best possible way. So yeah, yeah. For for you, Jared, I think you already said. But uh, for yeah, like I kind of just comments. Yeah, like I would say for me, I think I already rated it on Letterbox, so it's like a four for me. Uh, just because I thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed it, I was very captivated by the visuals. I was, uh, I guess when it comes to musicals, I'm, I'm like, it, I think it's, I'm at a certain point where I, I never really, I, this might sound weird, but it's also just my <laughs> personal music taste. I never expect to like, ever like the songs, I guess. It, okay. Like, if that makes, like, I, 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 I just like, I, I, if I'm watching, I guess like a musical, I'm going to watch, like watch it as a movie and not think of it as like an album, I guess. But like, yeah, if you're gonna, yeah. if I was gonna like, think you know, in sort of could, I guess if that makes sense. Because I guess I just I don't know. Like for me, I guess it's it. It may be just a lot of musical songs are not my thing. Uh, right. So like when I do watch them, it's you know I, I don't ever really think about my my thoughts toward the music itself, but more like how I the whole feel package. With, the whole yeah, I gotcha. guess. Gotcha. And so like, I will say I like the music in Tommy. I like. Yeah, I still think it's. I good. I I never actually listened to the album. I I am very behind on the Who. Uh, on on like in terms of you know the stuff that I I haven't listened. I never I never really got into their music. No, for no real good reason other than it just never happened. Right. Um. And so like you know I I was just also curious to see it just to hear their music and I I think you know. I enjoyed it. I, 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 you're right that there were the non-rock stuff, you know, sticks out uh, compared to the, the rock stuff. But you know, it sounds like you know, it sounds like it's a style they have less experience with. Right. Yeah. Um, for sure. You can but tell guess, when they're in their element, kind of thing. Yeah, you can definitely tell when they're in their element. Yeah. Um, but uh, just, I thought you know, Ken Russell just directed the hell out of it, edited the hell out of it, just made it this, like, propulsive, electrifying, like, journey, and it's just consistently making you either, like, drop your jaw, laugh, 
your ass off or like <laughs> you know or just make you say what yeah, 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 so, 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 like, somehow this thing is like scary like, and funny yeah, <laughs> yeah it's you know it's just he's doing what he, he intends to do with his film to just like you know give, make something that make that gives you a reaction that, like you know that that like sticks with you between like that like altered states the devils yeah oh yeah even the yeah, movie yeah, the, he did the, right after i think it was the film he did after i think i think it was either right after right before lit lit's I'm gonna mispronounce the name Lid Lids to Mania. It's like sort of a one. it's like an anti biopic because it's it's okay. like a guy a composer, but it's like Daltry oh, also anachron- has Roger complete, Daltry. Right. Yeah, yeah, completely anachronistic and just totally crazy and gonzo uh, oh. and and even more hyper like sexual. Um, <laughs> awesome. And uh, it's just it's very <laughs> over the top. It's it's like the, the, the tagline <laughs> on the poster is it out Tommy's Tommy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, I got to watch that. Funny. Yeah, that's that's the next one. Yeah, I, I was I was watching Tommy. I was thinking of that movie. A lot. Although I think I actually I'll admit, I think I like Tommy more. Maybe interesting it, on a dramatic level. It just engaged me a bit more than Lids Mania. But like Lids Mania is still a lot of fun and still very wacky and weird and worth watching. Sweet. Um, it just doesn't have, for me at least, it didn't have the same like emotional pulls, uh, uh, Tommy. But but still, check it out. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, this is the one thing you can expect of a Ken Russell film. It will be filled with visual detail and crazy editing choices. And I remember, uh, I think Dave Kerr was the one who described Tommy as somewhere. Uh, styl- this was in the seventies. He said stylistically, this is somewhere between the apocalypse and Andy Warhol. <laughs> so if that sounds um, interesting to you at all, I can recommend checking out uh, Tommy. But that's going to wrap it up for uh, Tommy here, and we're going to be right back, and we're going to be talking about Martin. Martin, another kind of terror. I would like to be like everyone else. I have to do things that I don't necessarily like to do. But I want to stay alive. I do need blood. From the director of Night of the Living Dead. All right, we are back and we are talking uh, Martin the 1977 American uh, psychological horror film written and directed by George Romero, who I don't think we've talked about since we did. Um, We finished off our episodes on the, uh, the dead trilogy. I think the last time we talked about him was Dawn of the dead and day of the dead, but we've also covered obviously night of the living dead on the show. We've also covered uh, the crazies and actually uh, recently uh, we included him on the bonus transmission because there's so little things coming out this year. We're including his, uh, his, the amusement park, which recently, Uh, I need to watch uh, that shutter, which, which rocks. Yeah. It's It's like 50, it's 50 minute PSA on elder abuse. That's just like <laughs> shot as horrifyingly as one could put and like, oh, as God. you could expect. It's like, a, it's like yeah, a maybe Twilight I watched that again. Episode. I watched that today. Uh, today, today. <laughs> is, I think the old man, um, that's in this is also in, in that as well. Um, the one okay, that, yeah. that takes the kid the, in or yeah. I guess not a kid. You know what? You're, you're totally right. That is the same guy. I didn't even yeah. put that together until right now. But yeah, so the, the, the old man who gets abused at the, uh, the, the amusement park that, that he goes to, which is just so funny. It's like all of the amusement park rides retrofitted to just like, be uh, d- discriminatory against old people. They like <laughs> steal all your jewelry before you get on rides. They they, they do bump bumper, bumper cars, cars. but <laughs> but yeah. But if you if the old person crashes into a young person, they go, "Why is this person even allowed on the on on the road?" And like <laughs> a, a cop actually comes and takes their license away and shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's really crazy stuff. So George, George Romero again, always someone who's uh, been interested in using genre as a means to kind of say something a little bit uh, more with the crazies. He was kind of talking about, you know, sort of uh, hysteria and military states and with the dead truly, obviously he covered everything from civil rights to the Vietnam era to police violence, consumerism, um, all kinds of different things that he, he tackled um, in that 
And then uh, here you get to see him doing something a little bit different. Cause was, uh, this was obviously um, before Dawn of the dead. And actually the first time that he worked with um, makeup artist, Tom Savini. And you can tell that, you know, uh, this is uh, honestly, apparently according to uh, him, this is his favorite film. Mm. Oh, wow. Um, that he made because and, and and I think it, it's partially because it was kind of uh, personal and regional because it was mm. like you know in where he was living they shot it on like no money and uh, it, it, one of the things I think he was always interested in doing and I think he felt he did the strongest here was that he wanted to comment on genre so for here you see him kind of repurposing mm-hmm. a horror myth the idea right. of, of vampires this like very yeah. classical thing that's existed since the earliest days of horror some of the especially cinematic horror you know some of the earliest german expressionist stuff took a lot from those kinds of stories and um he wanted to move it into a very sort of like realistic contemporary um class context and i think that he was um very successful here is what he had to say about uh martin and i think why he felt a lot for it um he said martin is designed um so uh that He's kind of being unclear with his wording here, actually, but essentially that, um, you know, supernatural monsters are part of our literary tradition and cinematic tradition. Um, and they are, in to him, they are, you know, expurgations of ourselves. They are, you know, something someone was inspired to do because of feelings that they had. They turned it into this mythical supernatural monster. Yeah. But, you know, so so they, they are beasts we've created in order to exercise the monster from within us. And he goes on to basically say that, you know, the whole point of his movie Martin is you can't just slice off that part of yourself and then throw it away. And now it's this object that doesn't exist inside of you. It's a permanent part of who we are. And, you know, it's, it's worth looking at ourselves and trying to understand it. So that was why he wanted to make a vampire movie that, as he saw it, didn't have magic, didn't have supernatural right. qualities to it. He wanted it to be this very lonely and depressing existence of a vampire, but just completely deromanticized. It's just and nothing but you know mundanity and domesticity, and the violence is fucking uh, like that of like a a street grit serial killer grindhouse film from like the late seventies or early eighties. Well, yeah, you know? the like, way it's like. The way that he even, you know, consumes the blood is more of like a slasher element because he ends up, <clears throat> sorry, he ends up cutting the the victims before taking in the blood yeah. a lot of the time. So it, it adds this, you know, we're used to uh, just them biting into the neck or something like mm-hmm. that. But, it, you know, it kind of reminded me of uh, the yeah, hunger. Yeah, no, he stabbed someone bit. in the neck with a stick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It kind of reminded me of the hunger when they take out the, um, that like elixir of, life knife or whatever and then stab them before they consume the blood it kind of reminded me of that a little bit um and just the constant like uh reminders that he puts in that there's really no magic involved in this it's purely just an animalistic need to feed um and Mm -hmm. uh like you know parts like when he shows the magic trick uh with the with the Mm. the two (laughs) blades and when he eats garlic in front of the the guy that's Mm -hmm. housing him and just saying like this isn't going to work there's nothing else here i am what i am and you know there's no bit of magic that's going to stop this um and yeah Mm -hmm. i really i really like I, i also like too that you know unlike something like the hunger which is very stylized and still has that supernatural quality this right um, removes that style and <laughs> yeah. also leaves it le- leaves it completely ambiguous um, whether or not this dude is actually a vampire who's really eighty four yeah. years old or whether his family sure. has just abused him into thinking that we because we do get he's those been t- like flashbacks but you're not sure if they're flashbacks yeah, they or more visions of what like the romantic vampire would be that kind of thing. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. I think it's really important that, you know, he is experiencing these like very beautifully shot black and white memories of what would be a more traditional vampire film. Right. But you're 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 left not knowing because he never actually does anything supernatural. He never grabs the fangs when he kills someone. It's not like this beautiful seduction kill. It's this very, you know, messy sequences where he's being called a freak rapist asshole and he's basically just like a, a creep following yeah. women around and then serial killing them. Right. So it's like, it, it's this thing. And, and he does have in his mind, he has this desire to kill and, and, and to drink blood. And, but, but again, even the depiction, it's closer to Abel Ferreira 
it's closer to right. the idea of it as drug addiction where he gets the shakes, mm-hmm. you know, like it's, yeah, not, yeah. It, it, it's always very unclear whether or not he actually has to do this stuff or whether he does it because he's had people in his family his whole life since he was a kid saying, you're a cursed vampire. You want yeah. to drink blood. Like if mm-hmm. that didn't happen, would he even have this desire in the first place? And that's something that Romero, I think intentionally leaves um, ambiguous and obviously leads you to kind of feel a little bit of sympathy and a little bit of pity um, for the character yeah, while also never character. letting you forget that, you know, the dude is actually a rapist and, and a killer. I mean, I think that opening scene is very important where it's just, you know, it's this very mournful synth as he prepares to feed on this woman. But again, there's nothing beautiful or seductive no. about it. It's just I this mean, very brutal attack that's messy and real where she thinks that she's being mugged and, you know, and uh, he targets her with a sense of like procedure where he, he does it like a serial killer where like he, he's figured out how to not get caught, how to make it look like she, she slashed her own wrist and right. you know and it, it, yeah it's very it's very creepy and the way that that merges with all of like the sort of 70s Pittsburgh location work that they do where it's like you know you get these beautiful black and white memories of or fantasies of him as a a vampire running through a castle after a beautiful woman being chased by a you know a mob mm-hmm. of religious fanatics and then all of a sudden cut to you know him you know in those sort of like rot and poverty of you know this real world location where he's like killing housewives and homeless people and being chased by the police and stuff like that it's yeah. very um it, it you know it's it's definitely part of Romero's i think overall point here yeah, I also really like the way that he uh, sets the tone right away. The movie just opens, like it just starts. And uh, mm-hmm. right away, yeah, they're yeah. just on the train getting on board. And one of the first things that you hear is that the woman is, oh, you're traveling all alone? And just being <laughs> in a, like, you know, that slasher sense, I think he understood what audiences probably knew was going to happen right away. Because the tone immediately mm-hmm. is something is wrong. This guy is off. He's stalking this woman. He's going. He's going to do something, and I just. I, I think yeah. I really appreciated that. Just like, th- uh-huh. just right out of the gate. Here's the tone. It's, it's, it's going to be sad. And you got your it's first black haunting. and white shot too. Yeah, yeah, and I, I the, thought that the that woman was a, smiling, and then, and then you know he opens, and then she was like, "Who are you?" <laughs> yeah, I also the uh, the whole thing where um, he opens it up and sees her as this like beautiful girl, like yeah, you know, yeah, that's what I mean. That's, right, uh, right, and then when when it's actually revealed, she's not even in the room, and she actually comes mm-hmm. out with like a face oh, right, mask yeah. on and all that, so yeah. it like breaks his it's illusion. Just completely, of, yeah. Yeah, it's it's really good stuff. And then and like Josh, what you were saying, I love those shots uh, of the city, just like the the overgrown weeds and the uh, like the, yeah. the barbed wires and and all that. It's it's really great. Yeah, I love the dirty streets and like the garbage underneath the bridges and like the train tracks that he walks on. It, it, it's like the opposite of glam or heightened <laughs> yes. uh, of anything that we were just talking about. Right? <laughs> it's very real. Yeah. It's all junkyards and beat up cars and shoes on the power lines and yeah, like a the, man dressed like Colonel Sanders taking him into his house. <laughs> like, the, like the color scheme of, of the last film was just every color you could possibly imagine. Whereas this one is purely just like black, brown, gray, just, just earth tones. The occasional red. <laughs> yeah. 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 The occasional red, of course. Yep. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I think he originally wanted to shoot the whole thing in black and white. Right, I didn't um, hear that. I, think I, that I, yeah. I, I do kind of like that they ended up um, making it this very sort of like mundane color palette instead. Yeah. Of the, the the black and white is reserved for the visions. I actually do think that that really works. That was a Me better too. choice. Yep, I agree. And and I, I love too because again, so that this the, the, he this character Martin who is established in the opening scene is a rapist and a murderer. Yeah, um, yeah. which is something that Romero like obviously wanted to hit off right off the start because eventually you are going to feel pity and, and sympathy for this character, but he wanted to go like, look, monsters are a real thing, and maybe the first vampire was literally just a rapist and a murderer who people mythologized and made into a romantic thing. Maybe that right. happened, um, mm-hmm. and so that's kind of part of what he's getting at here too. But then also how they then that myth has then fed back into the way that obviously we tell these stories and how, you know, his, his older cousin here, 
uh, which is very funny because obviously Martin looks like a young, uh, you know, he he looks like a like a young boy, like he's but he's supposed, he's supposed to be eighty four. Supposed to be eighty four. Yeah, he's supposed to be eighty four years old. He's <laughs> so he's like the same age as the cousin, basically. Yeah, that's why it's his cousin. <laughs> yeah, um, is that this elderly man? Yeah, but I love the performance from this man who you know is. Um, you know, very much treating him like he is this old world, like he's in a different mm-hmm. movie, like he's in Dracula. He's yeah. almost doing that um, that Anthony Hopkins uh, role in the Francis Ford Coppola Dracula, where he's like, <laughs> Nosferatu, yeah. vampire. Yeah, he's just like <laughs> very, uh, I will destroy you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah, yeah, he, he has actually like agreed, t- a takes him in as family member in, in an attempt mm-hmm. to, you know, not have him kill people and to also perhaps sort of like cure him. But he also wants to know that he thinks that he's very dangerous and that, you know, if you if you start killing people in the city and I hear about it, um, I will dead. destroy you without salvation. <laughs> what a threat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's badass. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I love the match cutting between um, the the. Um, cousin trying to fuck with him and like the, the mob trying to get the vampire yeah. and you know, them pulling out the garlic and the crosses and him eating the garlic and, you know, basically showing, you know, like there, there's no, there's no magic here. Everyone knows this, like it, 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 except for you, there's no real magic ever. And it's almost very disappointing um, right. to the, <laughs> to the cousin character, because honestly, if you think about it, like that's scarier. Yeah. It's scarier that there's not like this sort of like magical supernatural reason that there's horror yeah. in the world that it might just be a guy. It's also who just wants to kill people. It's also yeah. like when you have established rules for for these beasts, like you know the the wolf man. If mm-hmm. you get him with a silver bullet, he dies. That kind of stuff. There, there's a there's yeah. a easing of the mind that that brings because you know that there's some type of out in some way. Um, and with this, Very he's good. just slowly yeah. showing him how the only way you're really gonna be able to kill me is to legitimately kill me not none of these magic tricks um so mm-hmm. yeah yeah for sure definitely um like the way that um you know the that sort of contrast kind of defines the entire tension and, and drama of of the film as you're kind mm-hmm. of watching martin you're watching him in these domestic scenes and you kind of feel bad for him because you're kind of like yeah this cousin just thinks that this dude's a monster and you know maybe maybe he yeah, it's, is it's partially like, a monster because everyone tells mm-hmm. him he is <laughs> yeah it, it's this weird tug of war that you play where, where you just it's like you it's it's like you you're right like in in a sense you do feel bad for him but then like you know I always you know, just remember the opening scene and what, <laughs> yes. what else has he done that you you haven't seen in this movie and then you, you're like well maybe the cousin might be justified in his behavior <laughs> yeah. uh, but then again you know you're right I was sort of taking the movie when I was watching it a little more I guess literally just, I thought I was taking those black and white sequences to be to be flashbacks but I guess Me you're too. right there. They don't necessarily have to be like flashbacks. They could just be that's just his, you know, what he's thinking about in his head. It's like a in you know, a false memory or just delusion or whatever that that he, he has about himself. Or maybe because, yeah, well, the way, the way that I looked at it, born and raised in, in this environment where he's been constantly told this thing about himself, and so then he just like mm-hmm. he knows nothing else, literally. So he might as you know, it's like he has he's forced into believing it. And so, yeah, well, and and that's where the genre and style commentary kind of comes in with it because like those sequences are so shot like a classic vampire story. Yeah. And it's like, that would be Mm -hmm. if someone were to invent fake memories of them from, you know, hundreds of years ago or something like that, or like, you know, 80 years ago or whatever. Um, you know, they, of course they would look like a traditional vampire movie because that's how he, that's what he's seen in the movies. Yeah, and he right. even goes on the radio show and he's talking like, it's never happens oh, like yeah, how it happens in the movies. He great. even admits that he's seen those movies <laughs> and everything. Right. So like, it's yeah. like, it's one of those things where George Romero, I think was really smart because you can watch it and you can say, you know what? Those, it's totally possible those are flashbacks and that he's a vampire and that vampire imagery has just been kind of overblown through pop culture. And this is what they were kind of actually like. That's a way to view the movie or you are left with the the more sort of concerning and and troubling uh, element, Uh, which is that, you know, he was just told over and over again, our family is cursed. You're a monster. And mm -hmm. he developed these cravings uh, to, you know, suit the story that he was being told. Right. Yeah. 
So mm-hmm. it, it, it becomes really troubling where you watch these domestic sequences where, you know, they, they basically play out in the way that Romero shoots them. They play out like these kind of like abuse sequences. And then you watch him go out into the streets to actually, you know, make sense. He's like, well, the only reason my abuse would make sense to me, honestly, sort of similar to Tommy, he comes up with kind of like a reason for it. Uh, for him, it's, you know, this sort of like uh, this, this pinball Jesus enlightenment. For Tommy, it's like, well this would only make sense if I actually am a vampire who needs to go out and get blood and, and do things. So he goes out into the night and yeah. he stalks women and he eventually, you know, I, again too, I like that Romero very strategically doesn't shoot them like how any other sequence in a vampire movie would be done. Again, there's nothing sort of, um, seductive about you know him Uh, reaching over the woman and exposing her neck while he goes to take a bite it's like this sequence where he he plots to kill this housewife goes to her house Mm -hmm. find out that she actually has uh you know sort of she's having an affair and has someone home while her husband is gone and and it turns into just like this this messy cat and mouse absurd sequence of him like stabbing him with the needles and the guy's big enough that he needs to actually inject him twice because you know but then like the 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 woman's like freaking out because they can't call the cops because the guy's not supposed to be there yeah (laughs) it's so it's so farcical almost (laughs) yeah Yeah, no i was like laughing the whole time i was like is this you know it was like it just became so like uh, awkward and and but it felt yeah. like it, it, real because like that's probably how it would go you know something like that you know yeah I like, found where it to where be... no one is hitting no one's like people are throwing punches or just like trying to get to other people but they just miss or they're just not strong enough and then everyone just like freaking out and no one knows what to do and people are forgetting what number to call and like <laughs> you know people's brains are not working because they're just freaking out because there's just crazy guy in the house trying <laughs> yeah. to stab yeah. us with a needle. Yeah, I, I, I love the confusion like, of like, what yeah. did he eject me with? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then... What the fuck? <laughs> I think that that shift from focus, because we've been so hyper-focused on Martin the whole time, and for Romero to actually give these people a little bit of screen mm-hmm. time and, and like con- genuine concern, and it makes sense in yeah. the context of their lives, was just very interesting, and it really surprised me. It also helped... Mm-hmm the whole scene in its entirety because it, it takes a lot longer than I thought the scene was going to take because he injects him the first time and then he ends up like yeah. chasing him throughout the house and the house is yeah, very he... maze like like there's a lot of small yeah. rooms and small mm-hmm. hallways and stuff like that so the way that he films it um, is is almost like confusing in a way i think on purposely yeah, yeah uh, no it's extremely effective yeah it's like disorienting kind of like how they're feeling at, at the time a little bit um mm-hmm. but it's just amazing how many times like he hides and then comes back out to do another stabbing and then comes back yeah. out to steal the girl that kind of thing yeah. it's it, it made me wonder of a version of dracula that's like a comedy but he's not good he at his like, job he, he's, he's like just, stumbling around yeah. and keeps missing well his i mean real there's time is like, it, yeah. didn't mel brooks didn't mel brooks do like dracula dead and living it I've never seen that. I've I never seen saw it either. From Mel Brooks. Oh no! Hold on, I'll look it up real quick. Okay. Dracula isn't. Dra- I'm pretty sure Dracula dead and living it. Yeah, because I'd be interested. Yeah, it was to like see Mel Brooks is like la- It might have been his like last directed movie. Hold on. Mm. Yeah, it was. Okay. Literally, Mel Brooks' last movie is a comedy called Dracula Dead and Living. It's starring Leslie Nielsen as Dracula. <laughs> nice. I love that. And Mel Brooks is playing Professor Van Helsing. I've never seen it. I've never seen it. That's interesting. Uh, it's rated PG-13 for comedic sensuality and gore. And I imagine with well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to check that I out. Love, because I love has Leslie Nielsen like, yeah. doing uh, physical gag set pieces where he's like <laughs> trying it's, to it's, it's, kill people know, and not, he can't. <laughs> so I have no idea if that's it. the gag. I have no idea if that's the joke or not. But imagining <laughs> Leslie Nielsen as Dracula, it's probably going to be at least one of the jokes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But 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 I like too that even though again this is sort of like farcically kind of messy, it's still ultimately just kind of like very sad. Oh like yeah, he goes up to the woman yeah. and he's like, you know, I don't have to hurt you now because now I have blood from I got this, the other. This other guy. Yeah, I got I got the other guy and you know he shoves the stick into his neck and starts mm-hmm. drinking his blood and he has visions of the 
of the girl that he that he might have killed in his memory or fantasy and the lynch mob coming uh, after him. And then he, yeah. that's when he starts calling into the radio show and talking about, you know, yeah, I've seen the movies and, you know, people trying to catch your kind and, you know, things like that. They, they call him the count. He calls into yeah. like a disc jockey where everyone is like, hey, we got the count on the line yeah. he's in here. And he, he's talking about how he wants to go out into the night and kill someone around town. And, you know, they're they're very chill about it, actually, yeah. considering that, you know, he's not, uh, you know, lying. Yeah, yeah no, because um, I think they're just, I think he's like joking, I think. It just it seems like they think it's just he's doing a bit, and he just is like, I don't know. That's the the interp- I don't know. That's the vibe I got from from watching. Well, yeah. The, I mean, it, it definitely plays like they don't <laughs> think that he could go in there and start fucking just eating the the. Uh, yeah, and then the I love the credits. I love the ending credits that you hear the audio from like the next. I don't know from the following like record you know radio shows where the guy's just like, "Where is the cat? Where is the cat?" Everyone's been asking. Yeah. We gotta know. <laughs> one of my favorite um, elements of that is when the one guy says, "Like I think my friend is the count," so it kind of like <laughs> continues the mythology yeah. a little bit. But yeah. we can get to the, yeah. the end tell later. the story of the mm-hmm. count now. Yeah, <laughs> someone else is going to think he's the count. Right, he's exactly. Start killing people. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it's I, I, I love all over how, again. <laughs> how he calls into this radio show, and it's actually meant. It's like the only time he's like genuine. It's the only time yeah. he's like, uh, mm-hmm. like actually. It's almost like he's calling in for like therapy. And yeah, it's yeah. Just really like depressing uh, lines in there where he's just like, you know, most people care about dying, but for a long time, I've wished that someone would come along and 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 kill me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and you're like, damn, that's a very uh, brutal way to um, be living. And then he's also talking about, you know, how he's just kind of like this lonely young boy, and he's never really, you know, been romantic or had sex with a woman outside of um, when they're awake. Corpse, essentially. <laughs> so movies should stop oh, making uh, <laughs> vampires get pussy so much. <laughs> <laughs> It, it, it's uh, it, it's very uh, you know once again it's it's very pitiable but also very you know like genuinely um, sad at the same time watching him call into like a radio show for therapy just like this yeah. dude who thinks he's a vampire <laughs> yeah and then I they mean, they have at one point call in like the priest who believes in the old mystical rites and I, they even name drop the exorcist they were like yeah have you guys seen the exorcist i thought that was a good movie they call in the guy who thinks he's the real exorcist guy to try and like get the the demon out of him or whatever and there's mm-hmm. the shot of him having the um the the fantasies and, and and memories while the guy's going he commands you tremble in fear while like the the, the uncle has like the cross candles um going and 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 stuff like that um but this all leads to eventually he's making deliveries for his cousin's um butcher shop and he meets this uh, lonely depressed housewife named abby and uh she eventually you know she's she's very clearly um you know um you know, not in a relationship anymore. And she's, you know, obviously very isolated and, you know, they kind of, he finds someone who kind of feels some of the same, same things that he's feeling. Right. Um, and he's like, Holy shit, I actually relate to a human woman and I don't (laughs) want to, um, drink her blood. And he actually like has sex with this woman and shares an emotional bond with her. Although the sex scene is so like funny and uh, sad. Yeah. Like when it yeah, just and, cuts and, to and, them and, laying and she, on each top of each other. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and, and and then she's crying, and he's like, "Did mm-hmm. I do something wrong?" He's like, "I knew I should have worn a condom." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very um, very wonderfully um, smooth in yeah. his uh, in his operating with 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 women. But I, I love that this line that she gets towards him that I think is like really sad, which is that. You know, um, she says that she can't have kids, that something's wrong inside me. And that line really like sits with him there because, again, obviously he's having this very internal struggle at the same time, too. Obviously, it's being expressed kind of differently, but he's Mm -hmm. found someone who feels like there's something wrong with them. Right. Right. Um, And yeah, that leads to some craziness that, you know, comes back obviously near the end. But before then, there's this whole set piece. There's this whole subplot where like Tom Savini shows up as the cousin's granddaughter's husband. (laughs) And uh, 
this this woman uh christina who is the granddaughter is like someone who's constantly trying to push the cousin on the fact that you know like the magic isn't real and you know you should stop treating martin like a freak and you know she ends up kind of like leaving the cousin because of all of that but you know because he's not killing people anymore and because he's having sex with this woman the, his his shakes are starting to come back yeah. he's calling into the radio show saying you know i'm getting hungry i have to do something like something's wrong and he starts, uh, you know, letting he, he he has a hard time actually like picking a victim or something like yeah. that. He's like, you know, I, I don't I don't have quite the same desire. Like I I now have a real human relationship. I see these people as people, and he's been letting them go while wandering. You know, like the various Pittsburgh cities and alleys and bridges and you know yeah. all of these uh, various things that he's uh, doing. Speaking. But eventually, he goes driller killer style and just bluntly murders yeah. some homeless dudes really yeah. brutally. Yeah, speaking, and and speaking of shootout. and speaking of the like the violence itself, the way that he you know takes down people, he does even mention um, the fact that it was it became much easier after he started using the needles, which I just enjoyed like the the implication that before he had to really really struggle, and then I think it kind of mm. ties in with when he starts to look at all these people, like he can't decide who he wants. There there's something. Uh, some, something extra now inside him that's telling him to kind of stop doing what he's doing a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. And I just found it interesting mm-hmm. that he, throughout the film, implies also that before the needles, he had to, you know, physically take these people down. Um, and yeah. he, he kind of yeah, took we, a we, more coward. Which eventually way we out. see him do, right? Right. Because right. with the homeless guy, he like beats mm-hmm. that dude with like yeah. a pipe or something. Right, right. Yeah. Right. So it's like hinting at what he was doing before the needle. Yeah. Yeah, and then you finally yeah, see and, that kind of violence unleash, and yeah, it's it's pretty brutal. Well, yeah, and 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 again, how sort of like chaotic and and messy that yeah. situation is, where he kills this homeless dude, and then he breaks into the store to change his clothes because he didn't actually bring up bring a change of clothes. He didn't follow his proper procedure. He actually right. acted out of more out of this sort of like desperation that he mm-hmm. feels he should have, and then. Um, yeah, then the, the police actually start like hunting him down and he runs through like these various uh, sort of like drug dens and things like that and alleys. And, and he cops runs start and shooting he all the drug dealers or the yeah, homeless he, he people start, or whatever he, 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 he starts like a fucking gunfight yeah. um, in there between sort of like these cops and these criminals. And it turns into like a crime movie alley chase. Yeah. And there's like uh, a cop gets there's pinned. cars shattering. There's like dudes getting headshot, legs being blown yeah. out. Like Romero makes it as disgusting as possible. And then that sequence ends on just nothing but the car horn, the police siren, and like corpses everywhere yeah. while he's like walking around. It's mm-hmm. really it's really, really brutal. And yeah. the worst part is, is that he's doing this and he's not comforting, you know, this new girlfriend that he has Abby. And because he's not doing that, by the time he goes back and visits her, she's killed herself and she's yeah. killed herself using the razor blade in the same way that he made other, you know, he made other women look like they've committed suicide, but he didn't do it. She actually did just yeah. commit suicide, which is obviously for the being the only person that he's related to emotionally in this film. Yeah, it's like it's a very depressing that. sight. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and one of the first things he says is, "I didn't do this." That kind of thing. Yeah. So just to realize, it's yep. like I didn't even enact this violence, but it still, you know, it it still impacted me in a way because this was the only person I really had any type of connection with. So that yeah, there's a a really deep sadness uh, to that yeah. to that scene. Yeah, and yeah, the, the the I didn't do it. I really didn't do it. Like he, he's trying to like convince everyone and himself, uh, essentially, because it just looks so much like the the opening scene. Right. Yeah, it's um, like he might as well just that he committed plant a false memory and said that he did do it. Yeah, 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then and then we get. Uh, you know, as he's very once again lonely and walking around town, we get a cut to him in bed being yeah. woken up by. Uh, uh, I heard about Miss Santini. Yeah. Your soul is damned, Nosferatu. You do you <laughs> think that I? Do you think that I? Uh, I believe that you didn't do that. <laughs> and bam, that zoom out from his <laughs> face to the yeah. wooden stake sitting on his chest oh, to the cut to the wide okay. shot of just yep. that hammer just going in gushing blood, blood. yeah Tom Savini, baby. Crazy. the first time i saw that i was like what <laughs> yeah man it is wild yeah it's, it's so gnarly but like yeah it's uh i just lost it. 
Oh yeah, yeah. No, just that, the whole oh, that whole like ending, just like it, um, I don't know. Maybe this is like a weird comment, but like just like made me think of like doing like, a shitty run of like a choose your own adventure type of game or whatever, and like that's the ending you get. <laughs> if you like fucked everything up, you just like cats wake up in bed and your cousin stabs you with a stake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's like there's absolutely it feels as if there's no hope by the end of yeah. this movie. Like it, it's truly just a, a guy that was struggling with it an incredibly deep seated problem uh, that saw nothing but torment. Not a, any connection he made, you know, they they killed themselves or passed on. Maybe he killed them. Uh, the the one piece of family he seems to have ends up stabbing him in the heart with a stake. Like there's just it, it's it's endless uh, sadness and and anger and <laughs> violence and yeah well, it, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and, and my my favorite part of the stabbing is that it's once again it's in the style that Romero is doing. It's completely sudden and deromanticized. Like it's right. not yes. It's it, it, it's it's not, not like up. the stuff in Dracula from the Francis Ford Coppola Dracula, which right. in my opinion is like one of the most romantically stylized version of that story. <laughs> um, oh yeah. Like it, 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 it's not like the bit where, you know, she's like a, you know, the, the one woman's come back to life in the beautiful casket and they like decapitate her and even like and the blood flow. flowing. It has like a, has like a poetry to it. Right, and yeah, like, yeah. This, uh, this is like this is once again, polar opposite. <laughs> yeah. you're, you're left with the ambiguity of was this guy ever actually a vampire yeah. because a, a wooden stake to the heart would also kill a normal person. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so it, 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 you're, you're, you're just like, Oh, so did this man just fucking delude himself into thinking that this dude was a vampire convinced the kid, he was a vampire to horrible effect. And then in order to feel better about it. And also, you know, I, I think part of the reason this is layered into it is because it's also done mistakenly. He's actually doing it for the one person person in the movie he didn't kill <laughs> so, yeah. so, so again it, 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 it's it's a yeah. continuation of this story that he's convinced himself that he then yeah. starts staking him in the heart and again it's all done in one wide image mm. of this dude just very realistically shoving a hammering a wooden stake into this dude's heart and the blood going everywhere and yeah really like you know you're, you're left with a very um uneasy feeling um about it because of how sudden it is and because of how ambiguous it is and how realistic um it is for a movie about what's supposed to be a you know a young vampire or a kid who thinks he's a vampire. And then, so yeah, either way, very very crazy. And then yeah, the credits go over and it's like the disc jockey being like, "What happened to the count?" And it's the it's the older cousin um, burying burying him and and putting the small crucifix uh, atop his grave and everything like he that. He will not and rise yeah, again. No, yeah, and, and and you're just left to to sit there in the filth yeah. and just kind of think about it. So thank you. Um, George Romero. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Rest in peace, George Romero. He's just so good at breaking <laughs> hearts and minds, and any hope. Yeah. <laughs> it's like if, he was uh, like with Night so of the good. Living Dead. It's the same kind of thing. He just he just has these endings that are just such uh, sudden gut punches. Um, mm. And uh, oh yeah, yeah that, that dude's yeah. corpse being added to the pile after he gets shot down by the police <laughs> right. after surviving the zombie mm-hmm. apocalypse, crazy. Yeah. yeah, just just wild <laughs> stuff. Like George, <laughs> George mm-hmm. was a was a mad dog, man. Awesome stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I still, I, there's still a few of his ones that I need to get to. I think some of the less, lesser popular yeah. ones. But me too. I'm really glad you guys made me watch Martin. I really enjoyed that. <laughs> Yeah, no. Martin Martin was one of the ones that really um, surprised me when I when I first um, watched it because oh, I, yeah, I, and you did, this is I, right I hadn't heard Dawn it Dawn talked about as much. Crazy, yeah, right, after right before Dawn this, of the Dead. He did Dawn of the Dead. Yep, right after Martin. It's funny. I mean, you can yeah. definitely see like some you know similarity, like you know a uh, tunnel, somewhat you know the grand like, the sort of like I guess grounded feel. And the yeah. less like cinematic, you know, the, the sort of less cinematic quality or whatever. But I, I, I feel like, and then you know, they, they both have like their funny moments or awkward moments. But yeah, this one both, has I think know, more like awkward than anything else. But some of that yeah. awkwardness leads into a bit of of humor. Like I do find yeah. the chaos like of the uh, that house scene with with the guy that's 
cheating. Yeah, I'm think, I, mean, I guess I'm mainly just thinking about like the house, the the disc jockey stuff, and like the right, right. Some of the some of like the the cousin's performance. You know, the just yeah. like so when he his like introduction and like his those like in the first half, I feel like it was like you know uh, uh, a slight jolt, but like you know a good one, right? Because he's just like engaging and. In, fun to watch even though it's like the implications mm-hmm. of what's happening is very dark and sad and, and, <laughs> yes. and horrifying but like just you know the, the, the scenes themselves were I was like for whatever reason just like laughing and not laughing but like I don't know just, just well, also just incredible to see what he could do on like basically no money yeah. yeah, because like that, because because like, like that's it, the thing is Dawn of the Dead at the time was like one of his biggest budgets that he had received, and there's some really incredible like uh, style to it. Sometimes, like obviously, it still has that you know grounded in in one house. And social commentary kind of aspect, yeah. but like you know, there's there's some really impeccable like um, camera composition and mm-hmm. stuff like that, and, and the gore and, effects you know, are makeup great. effects. Yeah. Oh yeah, Nagori. Yeah, obviously the, the gore Yeah, but so but good. which That's also yeah, which is the only reason it happened was because of Martin because he met Tom Savini making Martin and then Tom right. Savini did all of the makeup for Dawn of the Dead. He's like, here's right. what you can do with money. This is what yeah. Tom Savini did with no money. Yeah, yeah. wild. So it's it, it's really crazy and and also it's it's you know I don't again it's hard to tell how true sometimes some of this stuff is but apparently the budget is listed as $250,000 but apparently it actually only cost $100,000 and they told they asked him to say that it cost $250,000 <laughs> because uh, they like, did, uh, the studio the, the, the people funding didn't want to let people know that they would um, that they could make a movie for like that cheap or something like that <laughs> they wanted <laughs> Wow, that's hilarious! It's funny on IMDb. I'm just looking at that right now. It says eighty thousand. Wow, or even uh, eighty thousand. See, these stories geez. are different, but like, although still. then again, you know, inflation I probably brings it to like a few. I don't know, like a few million, maybe. I I don't know inflation math. I'm totally guessing. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not <laughs> sure, but that is still probably wildly cheap for what we get. So or maybe I, I think you can Google it. There's like a calculator. Uh, inflation calculator. Was it 1977? 70. Yeah, so that's about 450,000 now. Okay. So not even not even half a mil. Not million. even half a mil. That's awesome. Wow. Yeah. That's killer. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and and that and that you can get something that's as rich with you know commentary both on on the class and also on the the genre and also you know just a really cool little character study and also mm-hmm. really gross and filthy and like the fact yeah. that you get all of that uh, is why Romero was um, one of the best. Oh yeah, but yeah, uh, pivoting towards reductive rating round. This one gets a gets a high for um, for me. I I think I I really do. I I think the first time I um, definitely you know I was more used to something like Day of the Dead, which is something that's so like front that's, to back in your face. Yeah, and about a lot takes, more like takes more of its cinematic. time. I think. But on on rewatch, Martin is you know absolutely I think one of my favorite. Um, Romero's and I think it's it's a huge part because of everything that he you know wanted to say about this idea of you know these stories we tell about supernatural monsters are actually really just about our ourselves and he really wanted you to feel that you know that kind of um, uneasiness and anxiety Mm -hmm. about that and he crafted an entire film that just completely de-romanticized vampires front to back and just sat you in the ickiness of it and I think you know it's it's very squirm inducingly messy at times Times when it comes to the murder sequences and also it's very um mm-hmm. humanizing by stripping him of all of this romantic lore and, and myth and dropping him into a real filthy world where he's just kind of this overt serial killing uh creep uh yeah. you know you you end up kind of who's who's also you know partially you know coded as a little bit of a of, of a drug addict and you know mm-hmm. other things like you you end up and obviously a, a victim too of possible familial abuse and everything. I think that you end up with a lot of conflicting feelings about this, despite the fact that, you know, Romero never lets you, um, 
you know, uh, not see that this dude is also a rapist and a murderer. So it's it's uncomfortable and, and distressing, but I think in very valuable ways that actually says something about, you know, um, both the, the, about the the mythology of vampires and the horror genre and, um, you know, real violence that real people do. So got to give credit to Romero on all those fronts, I think. Yeah, I I would uh, also give it the four. I thought this was uh, this was great. This is the first time that I saw this. Uh, I wasn't sure what to expect. I did uh, hear that it was quite uh, sad for a vampire slash mm. slasher film, and it definitely is. I mean, you're really just yeah. dealing with a guy that um, has some you know very deep seated psychological issues. And and Josh, you bringing up the fact that it might actually not be literal uh, didn't come into my head uh, when I was watching it the first time. I was, I think it was just because of those small lines where he's having conversations with uh, his uh, cousin and they're talking slight specifics. Like uh, I think at one point they mentioned an 1892 date or something like that. But once again, it still doesn't prove anything. You know, this, this could just be a, a belief yeah. that they have. And I really like now, uh, thinking back on the film, thinking it could be either or, where it's it's also a, a play on the genre itself and how uh, how they would film those kind of movies. I think that's a really cool idea, and, and I think he implemented that really well. Um, and yeah, and and you know, having Savini's just absolute amazing makeup uh, mm-hmm. uh, makeup artistry is great. Those like when he gets that stake in the chest and the blood just comes pouring <laughs> out of his out of his chest it fucking it's, flies it like hits oh the ceiling. yeah it's on un, it's unreal there's just such <laughs> oh, yeah. pain in that shot and and anger and sadness and yeah it's 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 really good so yeah four out of five um i i'm definitely going to be revisiting this probably a bunch of times so mm-hmm. comes yeah. out on uh 4k i think soon Ooh. So, Ooh. Maybe maybe Ooh. A, i've been fun to rewatch <laughs> for uh 4K. for you jared yeah, speaking of fours, I would also give it a four out of five. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I think I also gave it, I think it's what I gave it on Letterboxd. Yeah, thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, obviously a very different movie than Tommy, but, but uh, <laughs> uh, still, you know, made with a lot of intent and on a far smaller budget, and yet, like you guys are saying, just, you know, still pulled a lot of stuff off emotionally. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. and both still very yeah. thematically dense and very playful yeah, and thematically the genre. Yeah, it's like you know, it, 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 you know, you created this 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 really engaging character that you're scared of, you pity, you hate, you, yeah. you know, it's like you feel a lot of things, uh, and um, it just you know that the actor they got. The plan was great, you know. Just, yeah, we was, we didn't even get to really mention yeah, that, but he he is like, good. He he only ever showed up in other Romero movies by the uh, looks damn. of it. But he 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 I does look like a very his troubled IMDb, young creep. <laughs> his IMDb headshot is like I guess just like a rotted corpse or something. <laughs> it's like not even him. It's like I guess a like a zombie or something. Oh, mate, did like he play yeah, zombies? Yeah, probably from Dad. He, 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 he might have played zombies in the Dawn of the Dead. That's um, hilarious. Yeah. That's the headshot. That's great. <laughs> but, you yeah, know, he was, like, really good. Just, like, total, you know, he, he gives, like, a look, and you're just, like, uh, you know, like, it just puts you at, un, like, an unease. Yeah, it's a real uh, sadness mm-hmm. to him. And yet, there's also a sadness to it. It's, like, it's, it's tying a line that, you know, you feel like, you know, it's like one of those parts like, oh, yeah, this is the dude who's meant for that part, you know? Yeah, yeah, he's perfect. <laughs> and same for the the cousin. The, the cousin. That actor is great. Uh, yeah, he has that very classic. Yeah, go, go check out the amusement park. Yeah, he's yeah, great. Yeah, you need to watch him in the, amusement, in the amusement park. Um, I mean, really, everyone, all the, the lead. Apparently, Romero's cameo is the, the father. I totally didn't realize there's the, the, the priest. priest. The, yeah. Yeah. I totally didn't realize that when I was watching it. And then He's the one that loves the that. exorcist, right? Yeah. <laughs> Cause I'm just not used to seeing him looking like, you know, like a, like a, I guess like a, uh, 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 yeah, non, you know, yeah, a, a proper a, man. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to say, how do I dance? How do I say it properly? You know, when he's not old, <laughs> 
but <laughs> yeah, I, I, I always like to that he makes room to put Tom Savini in like most. Of yeah, his that's too. Yeah. every time I see him. Every time I see Tom Savini, I'm always like that dude looks so familiar. And then I'm reading, and then I read, oh yeah, Tom Savini. I'm like, oh shit, that's why. <laughs> Again, because like he's I, a very I, scary looking man. <laughs> yeah, he has like a very specific look, and I just always forget that it's him when I read. He shows up, and I'm always just like, oh that guy, I know that guy. Even though I should know it's Tom Savini, because usually he's showing up in like you know a horror movie with gore. In it. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to see that uh, Romero that he's in called Night Riders. I was just going like to mention him that. In, in, in in like warrior like medieval knight armor riding a motorcycle. <laughs> oh yeah, so it's like awesome. a yeah. And, and, and Tom Savini's not a small role. He's like second or third build in that movie, so he's got to oh, be nice. like like a pretty central character. Although I do think it's funny that after doing. You know the the makeup work that he did for Romero, he started getting like really really good. Like that that's when he started getting the Friday the Thirteenth work that he got. That's when he got um, Maniac, which has some of his most iconic gore in it. And honestly, Martin cl- feels more like a maniac than it does like a vampire movie, which is yeah. you know, probably a good a good connecting point mm. too. So I need to see Maniac. Maniac is disgusting. <laughs> yes. <I bet. laughs> But yeah, I think that that wraps it up for um, Martin, and that wraps it up for this week. That was uh, Tommy and Martin. We got to know both these fellas. Oh, yeah. Uh, both troubled in their own ways. Both um, both, 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 yeah. both interacting with the cruelty of the outside world. Yeah. But I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad to know them. I'm glad to add them to the catalog. <laughs> yeah. um, thanks so much, um, Jared, for, for joining us and talking about these films with us. Hey, uh, thank you, you for anything, inviting me. Um, yeah, this is a lot of plug. fun. Oh, while yeah. you're here this is where we uh, have you do that okay yeah plugs all right i got it i guess just 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 two uh one the movie that i'm in is coming out or well i guess but yeah by the time this episode is out i guess the movie will also be out uh it's yep. called it takes three it's a modernized high school update to like a Cyrano de Bergerac type story so it's like my character is uh, taking over another guy's social media so he can impress this girl that he has a crush on. Uh, and uh, it's the, 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 the broad idea of the plot. And uh, it's comedy. So, you know, hopefully you'll enjoy it. People enjoy it. Uh, awesome. Check so, it out. So, yeah. Uh, and, oh, yeah. And then I guess the other detail we shot, it was shot four years ago. Um, okay. Oh, goddamn. Yeah, what's it? The uh, pin? You're gonna be I a little bit younger. Actually, a high, I was actually high school age when I when I worked on it. So it's funny because like you know now I'm like 22 and four How does years that feel? later, like looking at something uh, that you've done four years ago and only like now it's being released. Is that something that you would think about? Well, yeah, no, it's surreal. It's like you know because you usually you film a movie and then the year later it comes out not four years later and then right so you know it's like uh i guess also too it's you know it's fun because i i had a genuine i did genuinely have a good time working on that movie so just like nice. seeing it again you know brings it back it's like bring bring brings back memory of just like brings back memories of just like being you know on that set with the cast and crew and and enjoying their company and all that but Very it's cool. also like it also makes me remember, you know, oh yeah, that was me right before going to college. I was super anxious about that shit. Just like, <laughs> right. you know, it was like, it's also, you know, it's like, uh, uh, just, um, you know, it's like a little mini blast from the past, but not that far back, but like far enough back that like, you know, you feel something. Yeah, like, yeah, definitely. I guess also to just with the yeah, pandemic. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't know how you guys do it because like I look at writing I did like three years ago, and I'm like, why did I write that? Yeah, you were an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did. So, I did not write the movie. So. No, no, no. Yeah, it's not, not what I meant. Sorry, I meant no, I meant no, just I artists in mean. general, like having that. to go it's back sorry, and, yeah. and, and look at work. Like this applies yeah, to Jamie that. too, because uh, right. Jamie is a musician, and you know sometimes his albums don't come out for many years after the fact, and by the time he's the, it's actually coming out, he's kind of like, I don't know if I liked the mm-hmm. the work that I did there. <laughs> yeah, no, I get that. I. I I, I even even that, even if the sure. work is great, it's just you know, yeah. It's hard no, to I get it. I you know I'm also like I get that way too. I'm yeah, like, you, yeah, you feel like um, you're trying you know. you're trying to progress all the time. So when you look, it's back like the, on yeah, there's a reason. Guess. There's a a reason I, I emphasize that I enjoy watching like everyone else when I watch you know a movie that I'm in. Like I enjoy watching mm-hmm. you know everyone else and all the other elements that aren't you know me. 
I guess. Right, right. <laughs> like, I ass- yeah, I imagine you'd have to focus more on your own character while you're filming it. So when you're just watching yeah. the movie, you can kind of engage with other things a little that more. That too. That too. You yeah. know, it's also like that. It's also that experience of like reminding myself, oh yeah, that's, you know, the context for, you know, what I was, you know, what my character, what I was putting my character through, I guess. Right, right. Like, yeah, that's uh, cool. But, but yeah, uh, so that's uh then I guess just the only other thing is just my Twitter. I don't know. Uh, it's <laughs> yeah. at, at real Jared Gilman. I just post a lot of jokes and stuff. Uh, and uh, but, cats. <laughs> yeah, and my cat. Yeah. Uh, well, now it's just, you know, now I'm down to a couple because I lost a couple this year. But, uh, oh, sorry to hear yeah, that. No, yeah, no, it's okay. I'm, you know, uh, it was all very sad. And, uh, you know, I'm still sad about it, but like, you know, it's been a few months uh, and, right. and, you know, life is moving on, but, uh, I'll admit it, Nick, it does. watching pig, you know, <laughs> that movie came out. I was maybe the easiest mark for that movie. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> because I had like, it, I saw it like a movie. couple very weeks, good. but I saw like a couple weeks after my cat died and I was just like, Oh God, this is like. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, gotta gotta just uh, keep moving forward. Yeah, uh, apparently. But um, anyway, I still got I, yeah. I still got a couple cats left. They're great. Nice. Yeah, we're we're big cat people. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> well, thanks for um for for joining us. For our listeners, we're going to be back in one week's time, where um I believe there's supposed to be a new Clint Eastwood movie coming out called Cry Macho <laughs> that we are kind of anticipating here on the yeah, show. Hopefully. We realized we we haven't um talked about Clint Eastwood's um directorial output yet somehow three years into the show i think we've talked about him once or twice uh, yeah. acting but we've never talked about his directing on this show so next week over on the patreon you can expect an episode on high plains drifter mm-hmm. from 1973 and the outlaw josie yeah. wales from 1976 two um westerns that he directed i believe his second um directorial output and then his fourth directorial output he did some other films um in between including like the Iger sanction and uh, play misty for me and stuff like that but i really wanted to get into um clint eastwood as a director wrestling with his own screen persona that was yeah. kind of developed in the in the 60s by the italian um filmmakers so we're gonna have a lot of fun talking about that next week over again patreon.com slash thesoids podcast for the uh, clint eastwood episode an episode that our discord has been screaming for us to do <laughs> for like months um and then the episode after that is going to be a uh special guest joining us to talk about one uh, cat people i believe this nice. is the paul schrader cat people Ooh. um which i haven't seen uh but i've seen the original and i'm very curious um <laughs> what uh paul schrader would do with that uh kind spoiler of story. alert he probably then, makes it horny yeah i would imagine i mean the the, the poster <laughs> is a woman who looks uh, very moist on the cover <laughs> Um, so I have a feeling that that's where Paul Schrader's going with that. But then the other film we're going to be talking about is one from 1987 called The Hidden, which has, um, Kyle MacLachlan in it. And it's directed by a guy named Jack Shoulder, who did, um, the, uh, second Nightmare on Elm Street film, which is a really, uh, a, a really strange and kind of like after the fact reclaimed kind of film now. But like, I'm, I'm curious to see what that director, um, might've done, um, elsewhere and also yeah. just interested to see uh, a movie with um kyle mclaughlin like that early i think i've only mm-hmm. ever seen him in um david lynch stuff. uh david lynch stuff yeah uh-huh. so like yeah. i've seen him in blue velvet and then into his 90s stuff i've never i didn't see what else he did in the 80s so it, this looks almost like kind of like a like a, a a horror science fiction like cop movie or something like that it, it, cool. it, it looks strange so cool. i'm curious so we're going to have a lot of fun uh, talking about those two films in two weeks' time. But yeah, that nice. being said, I think that wraps up for everything this week. Thanks so much for listening, and keep it sleazy. Keep it sleazy. Keep it sleazy? <laughs> yes. <laughs>